But now I'd like to invite uh, Ana Benito. She is a senior researcher at CDTEC Nanomedicine in the Basque Country. And uh, she's going to talk about the innovator's perspective on understanding regulatory requirements for nanomedical products prior to innovator regulator <laughs> interactions. <laughs> Too long. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. It's perfect. Thank you very much. <laughs> the presentation. And the presentation should. Okay, good afternoon everyone. Uh, CIDETEC Nanomedicine is an international institute for applied research in nanomedicine. Uh, among the different activities of our center, our group is implementing a GMP pilot plant operating under, uh, well, a pilot plant operating under GMP for the production of small batches of single, of, of polymeric nanoparticles in general. This work is being done in the framework of an Horizon 2020 project called Nanopilot. At the same time, our group in, uh, works on the development of different nanotechnologies, such as polymeric nanoparticles or nanocapsules. One of these developments is a, a strategy, an environmentally friendly strategy to prepare dextran-based single-chain polymeric nanoparticles which gave promising results in several biological uh, studies uh, to deliver drugs in, in, lung, in lungs. These results confirmed to us the potential for in, of innovation of this technology, but clinical validation is still required. And to enter clinical trials, one of the first regulatory requirements is to produce your product under GMP condition, good manufacturing practices. However, the production and the good manufacturing practices remains a challenge in most of the cases for innovators. First, according to our own experience during the implementation of Nanopilot project, first, it is not easy for innovators to find the right facilities to produce their first small batches of nanomaterials. And secondly, uh, we think, in our opinion, that we innovators are not really aware of what it really means to produce, a, 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 to, do a, to prepare a development to be translated into a GMP environment. That means to, to know, as, as Catherine uh, to, told, to know very well which are the parameters that are influencing more your process, which are the critical process parameters, and how are you controlling them during your, your process, which are the critical quality attributes of your raw materials and the final product, and if you have the enough techniques to control them, and which are the final characteristics of your final product, and if you have the right, the right and reliable techniques to characterize uh, them in order to ensure the final quality. Any small detail, any small change during the process production, during the production process, can make a change in the outcome of, the, of, the, of, of your product, and that involves a risk, that implies a risk to the patient, so working under GMP conditions, at the end, you are ensuring the final quality, and you are working on risk, ma risk management from the very beginning of your development. At the end, GMP standards, the principal goal of GMP standards is to ensure the final quality. In that way, any efficacy or safety studies you are going to, be, to, to do with your product is going to be more precise and accurate, accurate. So you are already reducing the risk to the patient in the development. I will show you now some of the work that in our group are doing in order to prepare this technology, this development, to go into GMP production process. Single chain polymeric nanoparticles, and it's just part of the work we, uh, we, we are doing, because it's huge, the work you need to do. Single chain polymeric nanoparticles are formed by the collapse of a one single polymer chain by the addition of an homobifunctional cross-linker into a polymer solution. After it is functionalized to obtain the final product, the, fi the final product, nanop nanoparticle. The size of our product, around 20 nanometers, is one of the critical quality attributes 
attributes, and it is obtained by the intra-cross-linking of this polymer. So inter-cross-linking between two or more uh, polymer chains must be avoided. This is very important. So um, we have started working with dextran polysaccharide because it is soluble, biocompatible, and biodegradable. However, it is highly branched and usually high polydispersed. So the first thing we, do, we did in order to improve our process was to change to a pharma-grade raw material. Pharma-grade dextran is more expensive, of course, but uh, they use compendial testing methods to, to check the quality. So, and they are already vali validated, so you are uh, assuring the quality of the raw material. In addition, it is much lower polydispersed. And that uh, helped us to control better the size of our final particles. Then we studied the, the process parameters by design of experiments and found that intercross-linking species appear when both concent concentration of a polymer and the amount of cross-linker were the highest. Vas viscosizer and DLS detected uh, particles bigger than six, 60 nanometers. We also found that the most critical process parameters were these both, the concentration of the polymer in the starting solution and the uh, amount of cross-linker added. Then we have studied the influence of the amount of cross-linker in the size of the particles by GPC refractive index. And show it, and this, this technique show it a decrease in the size because retention time increased of the, of the particles when increasing the cross-linker equivalent. That was an indication of the compaction of the polymer into the particle. This decrease was more significant in the case of higher highest uh, amount of cross-linker. However, a solder appeared here that could indicate the presence of intercross-linking species. This technique couldn't, uh, to elucidate this, if it, it was intercross-linking or not, we needed to study the, the hydrodynamic diameter and the shape of the particles as well. We used viscosizer uh, that measures the diffusion coefficient. The higher the diffusion coefficient of your particle, the smaller your particle is. And here again, we confirmed that though those particles with higher uh, amount of equivalent had higher diffusion coefficient, so they were smaller. And no intercross linkage was detected here either. Then we used sec moles in order to uh, measure the absolute molecular weight. And so that molecular weight, the absolute molecular weight increased with the number of, cro uh, with the amount of cross-linker as expected, but this, the samples eluded at the same retention time. And those, that means that they had the same hydrodynamic radius. That's an indication of a more compact structure, but not intercross-linking. And although the structure of the particles were more brand, they were still they were, the conformations were close still to spherical morphology. At the end, we used A4F technique, which injected the sample without filtering, and no column is used in this case. So the elimination of larger particles is avoided, and even so, no intercross-linking species were detect detected here and hydrodynamic radius was again smaller when increasing the amount of cross-linker. With all these results, and we have more techniques that have been used as NMR dosi or other techniques, we concluded that the solder we show in GPCRA is due to different branching or different uh, compaction of the structure, but not intercross-linking. And as a conclusion, I would say that Good manufacturing practice guidelines reduce already the risk to the patient when you apply it in the develop, during the development. And apply to both, of course, facilities, but also the process and the product. And that is something that we all some, uh, sometimes forget. And the techniques available today make possible a good understanding of the system. They are quite complementary. In our case, we needed just five techniques 
just to know if we had intercross linking or not. But validation and standardization of these techniques are, are, is, is needed. And based on our experience, and this is our opinion, most of the new developments in nanomedicine are not ready for manufacturing under GMP. And potential reasons could be the lack of awareness about GMP requirements of innovators. And also that maybe this preparation is too expensive and time consuming that it is unaffordable for, for the innovators working on nanomedicine. And finally, GMP facilities are not usually available either or affordable for nanotechnology innovators and technology transfer is also challenging. Some regulatory agencies have detected a lack of knowledge of the process performance when the manufacturers are not the developers. So there in the technology transfer is also a gap. And that was all. Thank you for your attention. This is our group. Questions. Thank you very much, Anna. Any questions from the room? I, I do have a question. Uh, did you have any interactions with regulators about how you are uh, operating the, the, the GMP pilot plant, either with GMP inspectors or even perhaps with other yeah. regulators? Yeah, we, 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 had, um, we had several meetings with the Spanish regulatory agency in order to design the pilot plant because our pilot plant want to be flexible and adaptable. To, to, to enter different kind of, pro, of products and give services. So we had several advices in order to define how to design the pilot plan. And also in this development, uh, we have been talking with people in the Spanish regulatory agency on how to approach to the, yes, to the manufact manufacturing and, and also the development, which are size, preclinical uh, size, yes, we are. We are talking to them, but it is not very easy to, to, to find the right people to answer the, the questions in, in, regulatory, in our uh, experience in, in the regulatory agency. Okay, that, that's, that's interesting. So you, you, you basically talk to people from the Spanish uh, yeah, regulators? Spanish regulatory agencies, yeah. yes. And uh, do you have any... Um, view on, on whether in the end it was useful or and do you think it was also useful for them? Uh, I think it, it, it was useful for, sure, for us for sure, but uh, I don't know if they are, maybe because we, we started talking to them when we were very early in the development mm. and we are, we are improving our conversations as, as we are gaining knowledge on what is real, uh, what, what do you really need to, to, to enter a clinical trial? As, as, as I said, and, and we have a lot of experience with other innovators, at the beginning you don't really uh, know what, what that means to enter clinical trials. You do your development at R&D level, and then, so we started our contacts with the regulatory agencies at the very beginning. We didn't know many things, but I think for us, has been, of course, very useful to start at that point. Okay, well, that sounds like a, a nice learning process. Thank you very much. Thank you.